Hi, I'm Melissa Fogel, DVM, and today we're talking about canine allergies. Okay, so this is the big one. It's super common, super frustrating, and super itchy. Here's an interesting fact about itch. Itch is so uncomfortable. The reason that we scratch an itch is that we'd rather feel pain than feel the sensation of itch. That just goes to tell you how miserable these dogs are. <laughs> So when we're thinking about allergies, there's three broad categories of allergy that our dogs could be suffering from. And unfortunately, there's not any kind of special silver bullet. It's a matter of working our way methodically down that list in terms of sorting out what's going on. Allergies to fleas, allergies to foods, and allergies to pollens in the air. And some dogs can suffer from more than one of these or some unfortunate dogs can suffer from all three. First, let's talk about fleas. I always start here because honestly, you'd really rather that your dog have a flea allergy than anything else. It's gonna be the easiest one to diagnose and the easiest one to manage. And you might say to yourself, fleas, not my dog, but not so fast. The thing that's interesting about flea allergy is that dogs are allergic to the saliva of the flea bite, which is odd to think about an insect even having saliva. Having said that, your dog doesn't have to have a high flea burden in order to be suffering. And in fact, the dogs that have flea allergies are usually the dogs that aren't experiencing a high flea burden, and yet they're incredibly uncomfortable. The dogs that come walking in covered in fleas aren't particularly bothered by it, that's not our flea allergic population. The key to ruling out flea allergy is we have to use a quality flea preventive on all of the pets in the house every single month, all year round. Be sure to do this step accurately. If we're not consistent, we skip some months, we don't treat all the animals, we use low quality product, we're gonna miss a diagnosis. The answer could have been sitting right in front of us. To learn more about fleas, check out my past videos. Okay, the second category is food allergy. Beef, dairy, chicken, and wheat are the most common allergens for dogs. Your first thought would be, fine, I'll just avoid foods that have those ingredients. Seems reasonable to me. Unfortunately, in the world of allergies, nothing could be that easy. I wish that it could be. There's a couple of hiccups there. Number one is the concern of cross-reactivity. If your pet happens to be sensitive to chicken, do we know are they also gonna be sensitive to duck or to turkey or any other feathered poultry meat source? So that's one hiccup we can run into. The other hiccup is the problem of the label on the pet food actually being representative of what's in that bag. There is a study that used PCR and ELISA testing and it showed that the over-the-counter products unfortunately don't really do a great job. They might say on the bag that they contain certain ingredients, but then when the researchers tested the actual food, they found other animal protein sources that were not reported on the label. Prescription diets fared far better in the studies than the over-the-counter diet. The way to rule out a food allergy or to diagnose it is to do what's called a food trial. And I'm not gonna lie, it's not an easy thing to go through. It's not gonna be fun. Everybody in the household is gonna have to be on the same page and know what we're doing. Is the pet has to eat the specialized diet and they can't have any other ingredients. They can't have any table food, they can't grab crumbs off the floor, they can't clean up after where the toddler was eating, outside treats, they can't go and eat the cat's food. It's really super strict. There's two different approaches that we can take to this. One is called the novel protein diet, the other is called hydrolyzed protein. So with a novel protein diet, the concept is that we pick a diet that has a single protein. It's a protein that your pet's immune system has never seen before. So in other words, a protein your pet's never eaten before. So some of these proteins can be things like venom, venison, rabbit. The problem is that a lot of these proteins have become mainstream. And so it's really easy as you wander through the pet store to find treats that proclaim to have rabbit or venison or any number of unusual protein sources on the label. Sometimes it's very challenging to know, is this really a novel protein for our pet? Has our dog actually eaten this protein before? Has their immune system had exposure to this protein before? For that reason, hydrolyzed protein diets are beginning to gain more traction. What a hydrolyzed protein diet is, is it's a diet that contains normal ingredient sources normal protein sources, but the proteins are hydrolyzed. That means they're broken down small enough that the pet's immune system can't identify them and can't react to them. So with the hydrolyzed protein diet, we don't have to worry, has the pet had a treat with rabbit in it before or has it had a diet with venison? It really doesn't matter. We're dodging that entire issue. The hydrolyzed protein diets typically are going to be prescription. It does need to be prescription. And then other steps to take 
when doing a food trial is we have to think about cross-contamination. If you store your pet's food like in a big food container or bin, your pet's food dishes, anything else that food has touched, all of that has to be washed. You have to remove traces of the original diet. And then you feed strictly the new diet. You have to give it for a period of eight weeks. So at the end of the eight week period, ideally, if it is a food allergy, you've seen an improvement in your dog's symptoms. And if you haven't seen an improvement and you've done your trials to a T, then you can say that you've ruled out a food allergy. That's likely not what we're dealing with and we can move on. Key to doing the food trial though is to doing it properly. It's a beast. It's really hard. It's a lot of work, but if you're gonna do it, you wanna only have to do it once. And they'll say, oh, I already tried that. But then if we talk and we dig a little deeper, we find out they didn't use an appropriate diet or they continue to have the dog have access to other protein sources. And so again, kind of like with the flea allergy, if it's not conducted properly, we could have missed that answer. It could have been right there sitting, waiting to be handed to us, but we missed it just because we, we didn't go through it correctly. So it's, it's really challenging and hard to do, but put in the effort, do it the right way and do it once. And then hopefully that part is behind you or you have your answer and then you can move forward from there. The final category is allergies to pollens in the air or environmental allergies, or the proper term is atopic dermatitis. So with this allergy, if we've done our flea prevention trial, we were super religious about it, our pet didn't improve with that, we did our dietary trial, our food trial, we were super rigid with that, our pet didn't improve, that's probably what you're left with at this point. Barring something else that can mimic allergies, such as mange or ringworm, do this in conjunction with your veterinarian. It's wise to rule out other possibilities, but barring that, that's what you'd be left with is allergies to pollens in the air. There's only one treatment option that can potentially alter the severity of the allergy itself, and that would be immunotherapy. So you hear about people talking about this that had severe allergies and went to an allergist and were tested and began allergy shots, and it's small exposures of little bits of what they're allergic to to teach their immune system to be less reactive. So that concept exists in veterinary medicine as well. Thankfully, it doesn't always have to be an injection. Um, that is one way to do it, but there's also something called sublingual, which is where you kind of squirt the treatment under your dog's tongue. So that's a way to get around the injections. This is the only treatment that can reduce the severity of the allergy, that can address the core root of that you have an allergy. Everything else that we have available manages the symptoms, which would be itch and secondary infection. So the cycle that we can see these dogs get into is that they itch from the allergy. So they lick, they chew, they scratch. All dogs have yeast and bacteria on their skin. It's a normal part of their skin or their flora. But when they sit there and they lick or they chew or they scratch, they disrupt their skin surface and they can get that natural occurring yeast and bacteria to overgrow. Now they have an infection. The skin's red, inflamed, scaly, malodorous, and their itch level goes through the roof. And now it's even harder to get on top of. So our two treatment goals are control itch and control and prevent infection. There's a several number of medications available on the market that can help with controlling itch. As far as managing and preventing infection, oftentimes we're turning to our topical products such as medicated shampoos or mousses or wipes. If you need to know more about how to give your dog a medicated bath, check out my video. Thanks for watching. I hope this helped. Allergies with dogs are complex, they're frustrating, it's a lot to get a handle on, and I hope that you took something away from this that's beneficial. If you did, please hit like, hit subscribe, hit notifications. Be sure to join our community of pet lovers. We're on a quest to get more information out there. Put it in the comments. What would you like to learn about? We'll do our best to address your concerns and questions.